Patrick and I met, uh, I don't know, like 15 years ago or something? I'm not that old, but yeah, you roughly had, 15 years. You had uh, dark hair. Not gray, you not were, gray. You were a little yeah. thinner. A little lot thinner, about 30 pounds, thanks for noticing. There's, right. um, um, but there's an interesting story for all you entrepreneurs out there in, pa in Patrick's tale, uh, which we're going to get into right now. But first, why don't you just open it up by talking about what Deem is, how it, and then like kind of how the vision that, that you had back then has become what it is now, without yeah. getting into the details. Yeah, so, so Deem, believe it or not, is 15 years old, and, and for those of you that are old enough to remember, we used to be called Reardon Commerce after Hank Reardon and Atlas Shrugged, and we were one of the pioneers in what is now known as software as a service or cloud. And today's vision and today's business is basically identical to what it was when I first started the company. Uh, for those of you that are unfamiliar with the B2B space, the easiest way to think about the company is we are the Amazon of B2B. So like Amazon, we were a pioneer in mobile and cloud. Like Amazon, we want to be the one-stop shop where a business can buy really any product, any service imaginable. So today we connect about 20,000, 20, I'm sorry, 29,000 businesses with 11 million unique products and services. And it ranges from travel services to office supplies and really anything else you, you might think of. Uh, like Amazon, we built a consumer grade experience and uh, we believe in personalization. Uh, the first application that we introduced many years ago was a travel application for businesses and it was designed around the metaphor of a, a personal uh, assistant. And many people that remember Reardon remember us for that travel application. Uh, and if you're familiar with B2B, the easiest way to think about Deem or Reardon is we are the cloud or mobile version of Concur and Ariba. So it's got travel, products, and integrated expense management in a single cloud suite. So what was the early days like? I mean, you were on the stages like this, conferences like this, yeah. back in 99, yeah. 2000, oh, talking yeah. about the cloud. Yeah, so we used to call it on-demand computing. Look at these young guys out there. They're like, Grandpa, tell me about on-demand computing, right? So, so we, we called it on-demand, then it was called SaaS, and now it's called cloud. And you guys take it all for granted, but back in the day, in 2000, 2001, people like myself, Evan Goldberg, from NetSuite, the founder of NetSuite, Mark Benioff, would sit on stages like this, sparsely attended crowds, and talk about this, and people would laugh. We were like a circus act. No one, no one could imagine that major companies would put their, their data in the cloud, in this right. on-demand environment. So everything's changed. So what were, the, what were the, uh, the early 2000s, after the crash, I mean, did, it, did that dot-com crash hurt you? Yeah. Did you sur how did you survive coming out of that? Yeah, interestingly enough, um, it didn't hurt us, it actually helped us. So when the internet bubble burst, there were hundreds of companies that were trying to do something similar to Reardon Commerce and Deem. Hundreds. Uh, both in the travel side, the expense side, and the sort of procurement side. And when the bubble burst, virtually all of them went out of business. So really, Ariba survived, Concur survived, we survived, not many others survived. So it actually was a blessing in disguise. Okay, so what, what was the size of the company? In 2003, 2004. Yeah. So when the company, when the bubble burst in 2002, 2003, we were 80 employees, and we were building our initial application, the travel application, and uh, it really allowed us to focus. Right? We weren't worried about competition; we were worried about the customer. Okay. So again, it was really a blessing in disguise. So what happened? So how come Benioff is worth I don't know six billion and in, 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 uh, yeah, so Mars probably you're, worth you're, ten billion, and, and I'm worth, worth something less, less than that. Um, so if you think about our business, it's a, what we call a commerce as a service business. So we have SaaS applications for travel and expense and purchasing, but we have this massive commerce network behind all that, where you can buy these 11 million products and services. And my view at the time was to get scale, I would partner with companies that could bring millions of merchants and millions of buyers, millions of businesses. So I decided, note to self, never do this again, I decided, and I own this, to partner with credit card companies between 2008 and 2011. So two major banks in New York with big credit card businesses put about $300 million into my company, signed very broad commercial agreements with us, and we effectively lost our company to those banks and those investors for, for many, many years. So we, uh, we lost our way, and we just got our company back 
uh, in late 2013. So we brought in Fidelity Investments and the largest private equity fund in China, Honey Capital in, to recapitalize the company, give management the company back, and now we're back to our regularly scheduled program. So what happened? Can you dive into the dark hours and how much? I might have to. I might have to lay down on this couch yes, and that's why drink we... a lot of vodka. Um, look, Team or Reardon Commerce was a very important company, guys. We were one of the two or three pioneers in SaaS. We were one of the fastest growing companies in the valley. Um, we had a pretty kick-ass culture. We attracted the best and the brightest. And when the banks came in, everything changed. And uh, it became a toxic place to work. The culture was dysfunctional. We had a bifurcated mission and, and vision for the business. And it was terrible. And, uh, you know, honestly, Bruce, it's, it, it, took, it took all the fortitude in the world to get this company back. So um, do you see entrepreneurs that come and talk to you? Do, do, do they often have to face that kind of decision too? Because now it seems like there's so much money. No, I don't, don't have think to... they do. I don't think they do. I, I think most entrepreneurs, given the abundance of venture capital in the market right now, most entrepreneurs don't have to look to corporate investment. And I would tell any entrepreneur, any CEO in the Valley, to avoid corporate investment like the plague. It is a devil's bargain. There is absolutely no upside whatsoever to partnering or taking capital from your corporate partners. Have great strategic relationships. Right. Have augmented channel partners. Do not let them invest in the company. But there are strategics out there that make sense. Like Qualcomm puts money into companies. Yeah. Intel Capital puts money into companies. Yeah. Those are different situations. Yeah, well, somehow they had better checks and balances around their board of directors than we, we did. We, we really did lose the company for many years. I mean, really, from two thousand and end of 2008 to the end of 2013, the management team of the company had very little say in the ultimate direction of the business. So how'd you put up a fight? What would what, what, what that look like, getting it you back? You know, I, I've got to choose my words carefully here. I apologize. I, usually I'm very controversial and a lot of fun and quotable. Um, we somehow compelled the banks to realize that um, this was not working for them and this was not working for us and that they were killing the golden goose, that ultimately we couldn't deliver anything for them if we were in trouble, and that we were constantly, systemically in trouble, yeah. um, building all these custom things for, for the banks. And so ultimately we prevailed upon them and we were very blessed, very fortunate. We got Fidelity Investments to come in, and you can imagine as a mutual fund, this is not something they ordinarily do, but they did a recapitalization. We wiped out a half of a billion dollars in, in preferred stock, half of a billion and gave the company back to management and then brought in a global private equity fund for expansion, global expansion capital. It just seems odd that a company, like a big bank, like a you know, Wall Street bank, for whom a few hundred million dollars is actually a rounding error, yeah. would be so interfering and, yeah. and care so much about screwing up your company. Yeah, I, I think that's, so that was my view when I first took the money. I figured, well, why would these guys care so much? Why would they want to hurt a company in Silicon Valley that's trying to help them? And, you know, it's hard to explain. I've never really figured it all out. I, uh, I think there are very good people in these banks. I think many of them want to do the right thing. I think these things have a way of taking on a life of their own. And having competitors involved in the same company, I think there was a fear of one of these banks having an advantage over the other. Mm -hmm. And so it led to just a very, very dysfunctional environment around the board of directors right. and the major investors. Okay. All right, so, so you came out. I mean, the, plus, the, plus you had the economic collapse in yeah. 08, 09. Yeah, it was probably, awesome. Probably. <laughs> it was awesome. Had a little extra dose of chaos to things. Uh, but now, how are things look? I mean, how, how long have things seemed to be healthy, and what have you done to kind of restore, recharge? Renew? Yeah, things, things are actually fantastic. I mean, there, there's life after a recapitalization. I mean, the, you know, we are full of gratitude at, at Deem. I mean, to have a near-death experience like that, um, you know, really provides perspective. And so today, we've had the company back for about a year and a half, and we just, you know, we just had a record quarter in Q1. We announced bookings growth of 280% quarter over quarter, annual contract value increased 340% quarter over quarter. Wow. And so we're killing it because we're focused on our core business, but also we, are, we actually are now getting some good luck after years of bad luck, and SAP, otherwise known as SAP, uh, has acquired our two direct competitors, right? So they bought Ariba for 4.3 billion, they bought Concur for 8.3 billion. 
And the market didn't like Concur, and the market didn't like, when I say the market, customers didn't like Ariba or Concur. They absolutely categorically do not like buying innovation, because there really is none from SAP. So we have been the biggest beneficiary of those acquisitions. So things are actually pretty fantastic. Why is your software better than Concur? I mean, I'm a Concur user. Yeah, I'm sorry to hear I that. I hated it until, but it's like eight, eight, or, eight or 10 months ago, yeah. it's gotten a lot better. Like right before they got bought by SAP. Yeah, got and, yeah and then so they, they, they got bought by SAP, where all innovation goes to die. And then immediately after the acquisition, two of the three founders quit Concur, right? Yeah. Okay, including the president and the CTO. And then they had to get on a press conference or a conference call and tell customers that they could no longer innovate, that they had such significant production and stability issues that they would have to get back to innovation later. So if you think about the companies that have been acquired by SAP, Ariba, Success Factors, these were innovators at one time, yeah. got acquired by SAP, all those that actually did the innovating at these companies have long since gone. All right, Lars, the founder of La Success. Lars he's left at, he's uh, at yeah. Andreessen Horowitz Lars now. split the nanosecond he could, Bob Calderoni, the CEO of Ariba, split the nanosecond he could. Two of the three founders of Concur left within weeks. I mean, I, I've never seen anything like that in, in my career. And so why are we better than them? I think it's pretty simple. We built our platform, our network, our applications natively as, as cloud, single instance, multi-tenant, now mobile first. We have always placed the user at the center of our design experience. So it's always been a consumer grade product and Concur is just not a consumer. I mean, I appreciate it's better than it used to be, so their tagline could be, we suck less. But at the end of the day, this is not a consumer experience. You don't go to Concur and then go to Expedia, for example, and feel like you're having a similar experience. You don't go to Amazon and then go to Ariba and feel like you're having a similar experience. So those products were built for the economic buyer, the, the travel manager or the chief procurement officer. They're never built for consumption by human beings. All right, so what are the consumery type things that, that the Deem product does? Do you have like the one click? Do you have uh, lots of information on each thing? Do you have self-service? Like what's, yeah. what's so great about it? Yeah, so our design bar is a consumer site. So whatever the best in class consumer application is for a particular area like flight or hotel or car or office supply, we benchmark against that. So we want to provide, so for travel, when you're in our travel application, you're looking at at TripAdvisor reviews. You're actually searching through the Google, we do our search through Google's ITA application, and then we shop through the GDSs or we buy directly from the airlines themselves, but you are experiencing a perfectly consistent consumer experience across the site, like you do with Amazon, except the magic in our software is policy is applied. So again, our software mediates in real time your preferences, your corporate policies, your company's negotiated deals with your preferred merchants. So it's the best of the consumer space with the best of the enterprise space. So uh, like who are some customers and how are they using it? Uh, so we've got 29,000 customers. They range from Fortune 50s to 50 person companies. Uh, Siemens. So Siemens has 100,000 employees in North America that book all of their travel through Deep. And the software is designed so that theoretically all 100,000 employees could be booking a trip concurrently and have a completely different experience in real time. So you're, you're a managing director, you might be able to see first class. I'm a summer intern, I see coach, for example. You get to stay at the Four Seasons, I'm at the Embassy Suites, or the Best Western. You can eat anywhere, I've got a per diem of $25. So we do all of that mediation and correlation in, in real time. So travel was the first application built on the platform. It was like books to Amazon was travel for, for us. But now again, you can buy virtually anything. Chevron sources and purchases oil rig equipment, oil rig equipment through our, our network. Uh, plumbers, small mom and pop plumbers buy their copper piping and wrenches through. through so what, what does that mean? You suck in the inventory information from other sites that That's make right. it available? So we have, this is all API driven. Okay. This is all deep integration. So we have hundreds of thousands of merchants that provide 11 million plus unique products and services across the network. So all the airlines, all the hotels, all the rental car companies. Uh, car service, you all know Uber, we're sort of the Uber of B2B. We have 8,500 merchants and 45,000 vehicles with licensed drivers from big brand names like Empire, Daybell, all connecting through software, right? Not screen scraping, we don't, it's not like Kayak where we're sending you off to them. Right. It's, a, it's like Amazon, it's a, it's a walled garden 
all integrated into our network, but with a consistent shopping experience. So you were doing Uber before Uber was doing Uber? We were doing Uber before Uber was doing Uber, but we're focused on, on B2B, we're not focused on the consumer space. Well, even Uber's focused, I mean, even like, I, I'm, you know, I do business yeah. cars. That's, a, that's fair, that's fair, but I, here's what I would say. It's very similar what happened on the travel side, okay? So employees, uh, when the initial B2B travel applications emerged, they were pretty crappy. So employees would go book on Expedia or Travelocity or Orbitz because it was a better experience. Right. When we came along with our travel application in 2005, we sort of stopped that. Employees and corporations started using us. We have the highest adoption rates in, in B2B, about 90%. And we believe with some of the things we're going to be announcing here in the coming weeks and months on the car service side, you'll have an Uber experience, but again, with policy, insured drivers, right? right. Insured vehicles, et cetera. Okay. And um, does SEP have a, more of an advantage in tying back to the financial systems? I mean, how do you, do you no, work with you know, the... No, everything's AP is so, so driven by web services and APIs now that we connect up to the big ERP systems. They have no advantage by, by having the SAP ERP suite, none okay. whatsoever. Okay. In fact, it's a disadvantage in many respects. So um, another player that's come along to compete is Amazon. I guess for yeah. a, a few years they've had the Amazon supply business, yep. which is everything that's over $1,000, you know, giant, heavier objects than a book. Yeah. Um, I don't know, it's, I guess it's going fairly well. Yeah. You can order ladders and things like that yeah. from them. And now they're, they're just rebranded as Amazon. Amazon for business. For business, yeah. so that's another yeah, it's a legitimate Patrick competitor. Grady obstacle. Yeah, it's a legitimate competitor. I mean, anyone that doesn't take Amazon seriously is probably not long for this world, to be, to be honest. Uh, but it's, it's not their DNA, guys. And any of you that may be in this audience that come from the B2B side of the house, I'm sure you appreciate this. Marketing and selling to businesses and supporting products for businesses is profoundly different. It's, it's just a completely different DNA. And Amazon, the, the notion of them building a sales force, selling to the Fortune 500 and then 2000, applying policy at the point of purchase, integrated expense management, all the things we do, it's just not something I imagine them doing for many, many, many years. But what if they come up through the bottom, you know, with the small companies that just already yeah. have their credit card on file with Amazon? You don't need to be a global 2000 Yeah, company. and I think that's where they're going to have a lot of success. I think small to low-end mid-market, they're going to have a lot of, a lot of success. That's not, your, that's not your market? We're, we're, very, we're in that space, but opportunistically. But, but one of the key areas of differentiation for us is they only do products. So we do all the travel and integrated expense management. And see it, I ran into a CEO last night actually having a margarita with you. He runs a 300 person company in, in Silicon Valley and he, he was using uh, Expensify for expense and then they got bigger, his company. So they needed something more robust. So we went with Concur, he hates it. I'm gonna be knocking on his, on his door when I get back to San Francisco. But he doesn't want an application for travel, an application for expense and a shopping application from Amazon. What he wants to be able to do is tell his employees, if you go to this one site, you can have the peace of mind knowing that whatever you buy is in policy and you're gonna get reimbursed because it integrates with your expense app. Right. That's a, that's a terrific value proposition. So uh, broad, more broadly speaking, I mean, do you see uh, a flourishing of more SaaS companies for B2B SaaS? There's, I think there's, there's so only, many of yeah. them. And I've, I heard a pretty reputable venture capitalist saying, uh, there's too many of them. Uh, for every leader, there's five followers, yeah. and there's yeah. only going to be room for, for one and a half companies. Yeah, it's in crazy, each, right? Each space, like the health club, this, yeah. no, it's medical, crazy. this, exactly. construction. Yeah, no, I, I would agree with that uh, analysis. We, we're very much an anomaly in that regard, which I'll get back to, but there is such an overabundance of venture, and creating a SaaS company now in 2015 is about 5% of the cost of setting one up when I set up my company, right? I mean, everything's different. So it's easier, that means not, not much of a bar to get started. But here's the reality, if you look at spaces like BI, SaaS BI, there are 40 or 50 companies yeah. chasing the same economic buyer and budget, so there's gonna be a massive shakeout. One of the very surprising and fortuitous outcomes for us is we got on the other side of this seven year nuclear winter and we don't have any new competitors. It's still legacy Concur, legacy Ariba, and now SAP, which we don't worry about at all. So we're very, very fortunate. I think it goes to the complexity of building a network of this size. Okay, so last word. Yeah. P 
piece of advice for entrepreneurs besides don't sell out to corporate partners? What else? Yeah, so here, here are my uh, very important pieces of advice for all of you, and I'm going to do a workshop on this tomorrow. Do not start a company without a co-founder. Uh, one of the worst things that happened to my company is when I was battling with these corporate investors, I had nobody at home in our offices in Silicon Valley protecting our culture from mercenaries. And so we lost our way, because you can't be in two places at once. That's number one. Number two, pick your board as carefully as you're going to pick your spouse. And number three, never, and I do mean never. Qualcomm is an exception. Intel might be an exception. But at all costs, try to avoid taking corporate capital. It is a devil's bargain. Okay. Thanks, Patrick. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you.